Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel, The Medieval Reader. So today, for Medieval Monday, I want to talk about the Jewish philosopher and poet of the 12th century, Judah Halevi. Halevi was born in 1075 and died in 1141 in Jerusalem, which during his lifetime was captured by the Crusaders. So when he died in Jerusalem, it was called the Kingdom of Jerusalem. But he spent most of his life in Toledo, Spain. Um, so he was living in post-reconquest Spain um, as a Jew. His philosophy and his poetry deal with questions of Jewish identity, religious and national, from the perspective of someone who grew up, uh, lived in post-reconquest Spain. Despite all of this, Halevi came from a wealthy elite family, and so he did enjoy quite a few privileges. So I only just very recently got into Halevi, and I hope to continue reading more of him, particularly moved uh, by this poem that he wrote, Sabbath My Love. I will link the poem below. It is particularly moving in light of the synagogue attack this past weekend. Halevi puts particular emphasis in God having chosen an enslaved people um, and the ways in which uh, those who are marginalized are then placed at the center of redemption. What's interesting about Halevi in light of last week's video on Peter Abelard is that he himself wrote a dialogue, um, but this time not between a philosopher and a Christian, but between a philosopher and a Jew and someone who is interested in converting into Judaism. His name is Al-Khuzari. It appears that he's some kind of pagan who ultimately, because of this rabbi um, in the dialogue, has this conversion to Judaism. The name of the dialogue is the Khuzari. That is what it is known as. It is in five parts with a conclusion. I have only read the first part, so I will be talking about my kind of initial impressions of the work, things that struck me. I hope to make more videos about Halevi because there were a number of things that really caught my attention and I really like his style. It is quite different, as you will see, to Abelard's. The translation I will be using is a 1905 translation by Hartwig Hirschfeld, um, and I will link it below. It is available um, online for free. Unlike Abelard, whom I talked about last week, Halevi believes that the intellect or reason can be a liability, um, that reason can prevent one from submitting to um, God's law, and um, he argues that if it were the case that reason could lead one to God, then um, and they would be better Jews than even the Jews, is what he um, says in the dialogue. The philosopher um, is very much convinced that it doesn't matter how you live your life, but that you know a lot, that you are intellectually mature. Um, so he places all of the emphasis on the intellect, um, but really not very much on um, orthopraxy, so living well, living according to the law. So here's what the philosopher says. Seek purity of heart in which way thou art able, provided thou hast acquired the sum total of knowledge in its real essence. So as long as the sum total of knowledge is known, it doesn't really matter how you live. Whereas of course the rabbi is, because it is what Judaism is, it's obedience to the law. Um, and so in the first part, the rabbi um, talks to Al-Khazari about the law and the historicity of the Jewish religion. Um, he talks about um, Judaism in the historical context and the evidence isn't reason. The evidence is tradition. It's the testimony, the oral and written testimony of people who actually experienced um, God in these miraculous ways. Um, so if you know, we saw in Abelard there was a lot of emphasis on, on reason and kind of intellectual demonstration. Um, for Halevi, this is not at all important. In fact, it can be a liability, as I said. Um, the emphasis is rather placed on um, the historical nature of the religion and, um, and that God has you know, entered into the world through speech. And it is through speech that humans come to know God. And it is also the reason that uh, Halevi gives for why 
the Jews were initially hesitant to uh, obey the Ten Commandments, the commandments of Moses, um, because when Moses came down from the mountain and saw that there was the golden calf, the explanation that Halevi gives for what happened is that people just couldn't believe that God would um, speak to human beings. Um, and so speech is very central to this dialogue and to understanding the relationship between the Jewish people and God. There are some uh, people today who believe that the world is 4,000 years old, but the date that's given, remember this dialogue was written in the 12th century, um, but the rabbi claims that the world is 4,900 years old. So um, I thought that was really interesting. There were other details um, that particularly caught my attention because I've seen claims like this in Renaissance writings. So for example, that Hebrew was the original language of the world um, and that uh, Hebrew was retained um, by some, but then lost after the Tower of Babel, um, but that Hebrew was the original language. I, I've seen this in Erasmus's writings um, during the Renaissance, so I thought that was very interesting. Um, another e example or a piece of evidence that um, the rabbi in the dialogue gives is that uh, people, there are particular practices that are similar between the Chinese, for example, and um, Spanish Jews. For example, the decimal system. So he says, well, why would people living so far apart from each other who have little to no contact with each other, how could they have adopted a similar system? And so he traces that back to Adam saying, well, you know, there is this shared common ancestor. What he does say, however, is that the Greeks did not come down the line of Adam. They thus get their knowledge secondhand, um, first from the Persians who got it from the Chaldeans. So because the Greeks did not get their knowledge directly from the Adamic people, um, it follows that uh, they can't know the truth. So <laughs> he makes this comment that um, if only Aristotle had been Jewish, um, a comment that you hear quite often, if only Aristotle had been Christian, you know, he would have believed certain things. If only, you know, Aristotle had been Jewish. This is a really common claim all the way through you know, the Middle Ages, Renaissance, the early modern period. Um, so here is what he says about Aristotle. Had he lived among a people with well-authenticated and generally acknowledged traditions, he would have applied his deductions and arguments to establish the theory of creation, however difficult, instead of eternity, which is even much more difficult to accept. So Aristotle believed that there was no um, beginning to creation, um, which of course, the rabbi denies um, and he says that the reason why Aristotle had this very faulty view um, was because the Greeks they weren't connected to the tradition in the way that other nations were. So there is a, again a historical basis to uh, why certain groups do not have knowledge of the truth and in this case the Greeks are um, mentioned because Aristotle is gaining popularity in the West. Um, as we saw last week. There's a lot of emphasis placed on God being the one who gives the law and the necessity of instruction from God because without instruction it would be like a person, he says, the rabbi, it would be like a person who is not a doctor giving out medicine that was made by a doctor, so he's giving out the right medicine but in the wrong dosage and so he's killing the patients instead of curing them. So without instruction, people won't know how to live rightly. Over and over again, there's a lot of emphasis on the material presence of God in speech, like the emphasis on speech, but also um, through manna, um, through the pillar of fire, um, and that despite all of the um, infractions of you know the Jews in the wilderness, that God continues to remain with them. Um, and that was a very hopeful message uh, and it really struck me for its emphasis on speech and language as somebody who studies language. And also because language as divine is this common theme that I want to explore more. There is one thing, however, that really um, took me aback and that is racism. Now, of course, racism had to have existed in the Middle Ages. It's simply not something I generally think about. 
And usually when I think about racism, it's more of, you know, uh, Christians versus Jews, or Christians versus Muslims, or Muslims versus Christians. But I don't usually think about it as white against black. However, there are multiple times in this dialogue when Halevi, through the rabbi, or Al-Khazari, um, will make disparaging comments about black people. And that really caught me by surprise. It made me, you know, makes me want to read more about um, race in the Middle Ages. I know that there is a book out that's called The Invention of Race in the European Middle Ages. Um, and I've been meaning to get to it. The title seems a bit bold in its claim. Um, the European Middle Ages is the, where race was invented. I mean, how are we defining race? Surely race and racism existed before the Middle Ages, it existed in the East. I mean, so again, I, I want to read this book for myself. The book of the history of race in the European Middle Ages actually begins in the 12th century, um, which now is like, okay, um, I want to learn more about it. So for example, there's this line, if the law were binding on us only because God created us, the white and the black man would be equal since he created them all. There's other um, passages that he didn't include because there are much more. Um, yeah, I, would, I don't want to uh, read this out. Um, but there were enough moments like this that really caught me by surprise. I was like, wow, okay. Um, that being said, there's discussion about how um, there were prophetesses, so women um, as well as men were chosen to be prophets. Um, and, you know, it's just this really interesting dialogue that I will be finishing in the next couple of weeks. I did notice that the second book deals with the Hebrew language, and because I cannot read Hebrew, I will most likely skip the second book. Um, but I think that the other books will um, not particularly deal with grammar, and so I will be able to follow that more. Um, the first book, however, really sets the tone. It's really a, a challenge, in part, to um, someone like Peter Abelard. Um, who, or even Maimonides later, um, to include reason in the context of um, theology, in the context of discussions about God, um, and, and also a defense of um, Jewish practices. So yeah, these are kind of my initial thoughts about Yudah Halevi. Um, let me know if you have read anything by him. I will link below, like I said, Sabbath My Love, which really, really moved me. Um, as well as the Kuzari dialogue. Um, and I will talk to you later. Bye now.